Hello and welcome everyone to today's webinar, Better Water Governance, Evidence-Based Decision Making for Practitioners and Policymakers. I am Shane Hampshire with ARC International and I'll be your uh, webinar technician for today. I'll be happy to help you with any technical issues you have and I'll be collecting questions from the chat window as we go along today for the Q&A submit at the conclusion of today's webinar and present those to their today's presenters. You'll notice on the left-hand side of your screen you have a chat window. That's a perfect place to ask for any technical assistance. And as I said, please enter your questions at any time as you have them, and we'll collect them for the end. In the middle of the screen is where you'll see today's content move ahead. And at any time, if you're having a hard time getting our attention, there is an icon on the top of your screen of a person with their hand raised. You click that, I will uh, talk to you directly into the chat window and see how I can help you. Today's webinar is being recorded for archival purposes. We'll be sending out an email after the conclusion in the next few days if you want to revisit this webinar. And now I'm happy to hand things over to Barbara Rothfiller to kick us off. Thank you very much, Shane. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone, depending on from where you are joining us. We very much appreciate everyone taking the time out of their busy schedules to join us here at RTI International for this Better Water Governance webinar. We are going to examine this morning evidence-based decision-making for practitioners and policymakers. Governance has long been associated primarily with the management of political systems. There's been growing understanding over the last decade or so, however, that good governance is essential for managing anything, from a government to a business to vital resources, such as water and the environment. The recent USAID Global Water and Development Report gave what I think is one of the best definitions of governance as it relates to WASH. Governance refers to the political, social, economic, and administrative systems that in place that influence water and sanitation use and management. And we see governance playing a central role in USAID and other donor assistance to the WASH sector around the world. The central concept for today's webinar is that good governance in water and sanitation requires evidence-based decision-making. Clearly, this is not a radical idea. The U.S. government's global water strategy's first development result is to strengthen sector governance and financing. It is further defined by USAID in the global water strategy, as you can see here, as support to the development and implementation of governance systems grounded in evidence to provide a sound framework for safe water and sanitation services and water resources management at all levels. And I think the at all levels is something really important that we're going to get into more today. Uh, and this is really, I think, where the thinking around governance in water and wash is really changing. For today's event, we will examine how evidence is driving improved water governance of resources and wash service delivery, both on the ground and in policy reform. We will provide a framework for understanding and assessing the value of data and information resources in the context of water governance and learn how to adapt when there's a lack of high quality data available on the ground. We will also discuss the kinds of evidence needed for water governance, why it matters so much, and how to make it accessible and useful to stakeholders and decision makers, showcasing cases from Jordan, Nigeria, El Salvador, Mozambique, and others. So for this agenda, there are two presentations, as you can see on your screen. Data droughts and data floods, assessing and optimizing the value of data for water governance. And then why evidence matters to water sector governance. Data, context, and calibration for resources management and wash service delivery. These examine how to get to the point where you do, in fact, have evidence-based decision making. As I'm sure we have all seen, this isn't easy. Often, there isn't actually any data on which to form evidence, a data drought. In some places, there's plenty of data, so much data that you don't know how to make sense of it all and make sure that it is actually appropriate for those that need it the most. And all too often, even with data and evidence, the real challenge is getting decision makers to even pay attention to whatever evidence exists. And on this point, we'd actually love to hear from all of you that are participating. You will see a quick poll appear on your screen. Simple question, what do you think is the more critical challenge? Data drought, data floods, 
or getting stakeholders to pay attention to the data. We'll keep this up for a few minutes, and then we'll show you the results in a little bit. So, let's get to it. To start things off, I would like to introduce our speaker today. George Van Hoopsen is a senior environmental economist in RTI's Center for Water Resources, with over 20 years of experience managing and conducting policy research focused on water management issues. He specializes in economic valuation of water resources, human health, and ecosystem services, and in interdisciplinary approaches that link environmental and economic models to support cost-benefit analyses of public sector interventions. Katie von Workhoven is a senior water resources engineer in RTI's Center for Water Resources with 20 years of experience in water resources analysis and modeling to support public and private water management organizations worldwide. She specializes in stream flow forecasting, impacts of environmental change, water quality assessment, and communication of technical information to stakeholders. Dennis Wanza is currently the Chief of Party of the USAID Nigeria Effective Water, Sanitation, and Hygiene Services Program, or EWASH, which is a $60 million USAID-funded water sector reform program working currently in Nigeria. Prior to joining, joining RTI, Dennis worked as the Deputy Director for the WASH team at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He is also the former Chief of Party of the U.S.-funded SUASA program, which was a regional program tackling many of these issues in, in Nairobi, Kenya. And I am Barbara Rossmiller, the Director of the Climate, Natural Resources, and Water team in RTI's International Development Group. I have 25 years of experience in managing integrated programs in water, natural resources, community development, and institutional development. I specialize in water sector governance and reform and served as the chief of party for the USA Jordan Institutional Support and Strengthening Program, or ISSP. And with the administrative bits out of the way, I'd like to happily turn it over to George and Katie for the first presentation. Great, thanks. Thanks very much, Barbara. Um, so I'm going to kick things off here with uh, this part of the discussion by presenting a general conceptual framework for assessing and optimizing the value data for water governance, and then I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Katie, who will expand on the framework with a few project examples. So um, as a background, uh, it's difficult to summarize in a few words what we mean by data for water governance, because uh, water governance encompasses uh, such an enormous variety of activities, each with its own objectives and challenges. But one way to do it is as shown on this slide and on the next one, and here we're we have governance activities organized according to their uh, temporal characteristics, so going from short-term to medium and long-term activities, and each of them with corresponding data needs, which are shown on the following slide, which I'll toggle to uh, briefly. Um, so, for example, going back to just uh, the short-term decision, so looking at, for example, day-to-day -day operations and communications, uh, for example, operating dams or managing water treatment facilities, those oftentimes are going to require uh, real-time data on, on weather and flood forecasting. Uh, in contrast, uh, medium-term decisions, uh, such as monitoring and compliance and issuing permits and those kinds of things, can require monthly annual data, for example, uh, on stream flow monitoring, sectoral, sectoral water use to make those kinds of decisions. And finally, when we're looking at these long-term issues like water management planning, then obviously we need more uh, long-term data looking into the future, for example, climate forecasts and population projections. And so there are different ways of thinking about this and organizing. We could also do it spatially, thinking about data going from local to state level up to international and different data needs. But any way you cut it, um, specific data needs are going to vary greatly depending on the water governance activity. But the importance of data for effective decision making is going to be a consistent theme throughout um, any of these activities. So as a result, when, when data are lacking, or a poor quality, so the example um, Barb mentioned of what we might call a data drought, and we have to begin by evaluating different types of investments in data collection and data development. And so on this slide, it shows a somewhat different way of thinking about and organizing the types of data that we might need for water governance, adapted from a study by Mark Julin et al. Um, it shows on the left uh, uh, water systems, um, uh, natural systems that supply water and the types of data that we might need for informing those, that type of, uh, those types of uh, issues. And then on the right, the social systems and the use of water and water demand. 
and then in between withdrawals and return flows. And so um, for any of these elements of data, when, we, when we're faced with a data drought, then we need to develop uh, data that can usually take one of these three kinds of forms. So first of all, we may need to collect and develop monitoring or observational approaches ranging from remote sensing through satellites and drones all the way to in situ measurements of, uh, of streams or, for, or water metering. Um, alternatively, we can use modeling approaches where existing data is processed and applied for things like stream forecasting or population projections. Or finally, we can use survey-based approaches, and of course that's mostly for collecting socioeconomic information, but can also be used to collect information on, on natural systems. Or we have to look at combinations of these things, but regardless, like any investment, it's important to weigh the cost and benefits of these different, uh, these different approaches. As you can tell, I'm an economist, so <laughs> that's going to be my perspective on that. Uh, so, um, so whereas the previous slide focused on data droughts, um, we can also be uh, fo uh, face conditions where we have an overabundance of data, so the data flood condition that Barbara mentioned. And uh, this can also present a challenge for water governance and require different kinds of investments. Uh, for example, there are currently massive amounts of data being generated through satellite remote sensing, but governments often lack the capacity to process these data in an effective way. And in these cases, data in, uh, investments in data processing and management are becoming more important and more of a priority. But regardless of whether one's dealing with a data drought or a data flood, a common challenge is how to estimate the value of new information, the value of better information, and the investments required to improve information. And doing this typically is going to require, first of all, that you identify what are the key decisions and behaviors that are going to be affected, and then assess how those will be improved by different kinds um, of information. So um, as our capacity to collect and process enormous amounts of data has grown, so has a number of studies that have focused on actually trying to measure the value of information. So clearly, obviously, information has value, but it's also inherently intangible. So it presents a challenge for doing economic valuation. But whether it's valuing information for medical screening tests or for fish consumption advisories or for weather forecasts, all of these studies and approaches seem to come back to the same building blocks that are shown on this figure. And so I'll go through each one of these quickly with a, with a short example. And so by state, what we mean is um, the state of the world. So the state of the world that's, uncert that's uncertain for decision makers. So for example, flood or no flood. In other words, will there be a flood or will there not be a flood? Uh, the second part is the signal. So here is where the information comes in, the information about the state of the world, which in some way is going to reduce or resolve that uncertainty in best cases. So for example, in this case, um, a flood forecast. And so um, information has value because it reduces uncertainty. We all like to reduce uncertainty. But in the end, it really doesn't have value if it doesn't translate into some change in action. If it doesn't allow you to make, in some ways, better decisions. And so an action, in this case, is some, some choice that a decision maker would use using the signal. So for example, whether or not to issue an evacuation order. So this is from the perspective of uh, the public sector decision maker um, and, uh, or the emergency management authority. And so the different um, actions, um, in this case, evacuation or, or no evacuation order, have a different value. So they have a benefit or cost compared to the reference conditions before the issue is being addressed, which depends to some extent on what the state of the world turns out to be. So for example, if a flood occurs and you don't issue the evacuation order, then you have to incur the cost of rescue operations. If no flood occurs and you issue the evacuation order, well, then you're basically where you started out. But if a flood occurs and you do issue the evacuation order, then you have to incur the cost of evacuation. And in fact, regardless whether or not the flood occurs, you're going to have to incur that cost. And so those are the values of the actions. But then the question is, well, what does information tell you? Well, in this case, clearly there are better decisions, which are in the boxes, and worse decisions. Um, and the value of information is essentially allowing you to compare, to use the information to make the better decision under a given state of the world. So for example, if a flood occurs, um, you issue the evacuation order, what that allows you to do is to uh, avoid the cost of rescue operations. So that's some of the value that you get from the information, even though you have to incur the cost of evacuation. Now, on the other side, if there's no evacuation and, and no flood, then you avoid the cost of the evacuation. So it allows you to avoid making, in some sense, mistakes. And so to measure the value of information, one needs to be able to predict, first of all, what actions are decision makers going to take when faced with different signals? And then also, what are the values of different actions under different states of the world? So 
what types of losses from ill-informed actions can be avoided? And um, speaking of ill-informed actions, this is me standing in a, a recent in my driveway uh, after Hurricane Matthew. So, um, in case you're wondering what that was, um, so um, so this is you know what I just showed is a fairly simple framework for going from uh, signal to action. But obviously, things can get a lot more complicated than that. Um, and so we can turn to this sort of, sort of framework, which uh, was adapted from a paper by DeVries and is a framework for knowledge management. They call it DICAR, D-I, so data, knowledge, uh, action, and results. We've you know, changed it a little bit to value just to fit with our what we're discussing. But um, the same ideas apply. And so the main thing being, so you know, data start on the left, starting with data, that only has value if it's converted to information. So it's only that value if it's into a form that is usable and interpretable by decision makers. And then going from there, information only has value that can be translated to knowledge. So understanding the decision makers or of the implications of the information. And together, a data, information, and knowledge, those really form the evidence base that we're talking about, as that Barbara mentioned, and as part of the title of the overall discussion. And then from there, knowledge only has value if it's actionable. The value of actions often depend, importantly, on the effectiveness of, of how those actions are implemented. So the value of investments in data are going to depend critically on each of these steps, and optimizing that value is going to require investments to bridge certain gaps along the way. So for example, the design gaps which occur between data information require investments in, for example, data quality, accessibility, and interoperability. Uh, bridging the gap between information and knowledge is an expertise gap, which can require investments in education, skills development, and other capacity building. The gap between knowledge and action uh, can require investments to improve incentives or reduce institutional barriers for action. And then finally, to bridge that gap between action and value, the execution gap, we can make investments in program evaluation and adaptive management to learn from our mistakes and improve how we um, execute those, uh, those actions. And so given that framework, I'm going to turn it over to Katie now, and she's going to use this framework to discuss some specific project examples. Okay, so I'm going to take that framework that George just described and, and demonstrate how one could apply that for different types of water resources management objectives. And specifically kind of thinking through the steps of how do we take a specific objective in the, um, and define what each element of that process are and identify the gaps so that we can reduce barriers to finding the value in the information. And I'll talk through a couple of examples. I'll use a couple of, uh, of examples from RTI projects in Bangladesh, the Nile Basin, and El Salvador to concretely demonstrate some examples of design or types of gaps that we've encountered along the way, and in some cases, some solutions um, that we've found. And I just want to uh, point out, here's that, here's that framework. I want to point out that there is no one way to apply this framework. How the examples. Um, the breakdown that I'm going to show here is, is from a specific perspective. Um, and I'm going to highlight uh, two contrasting types of water resources management projects or objectives. The first, tying back into some of the examples George was talking about, the flood warning example. Uh, so for the flood warning example, what is the data? What's the data that is necessary to, to achieve the end result of protected life and property? Um, the, the data, the fundamental data for a flood warning system is hydrometeorological data. That can be either observed on the ground through gauging stations like the one shown in the photo, or it could be through um, satellite-based systems, um, as George described also, are becoming more and more um, available. Information for the flood warning, uh, for the flood warning example is um, how are river conditions changing over time? It's translating that you know, raw data from a satellite and pulling it into something that makes sense, something that's interpretable um, for, the, for the objective. Knowledge, in this case, is what is the context? What do those changing river conditions mean for communities? Uh, what communities are at risk? What are the flood thresholds that cause, um, that cause impacts to occur? Action from the perspective of a public entity would be issuing a flood warning. And then um, the value would be achieved if people are protected. People and property are protected. Um, if they evacuate, if they have time, if they had, have advanced warning to um, bring their belongings to safety, to um, even something that we might not think about, like early harvest, uh, where farmers have enough time to sell their crops ahead of, a, of an impending event and not lose 
their entire crop. Okay, so as George described, within each of these steps, there are gaps. There's potential gaps. And there's a lot of examples for each one of these gaps. And I'm just, um, I'm just showing a couple that we came up with here. Um, the design gap, as George described, is, uh, can arise not only from non-existent data completely, but data not being accessible, um, not being shared, not being in a format that's usable, not being usable for the objective, uh, for the intended objective. One simple example, a very common example, is Gage is not reporting, and therefore not transmitting the, the necessary data. An example of an expertise gap is unknown flood thresholds. It's not known simply how changing river conditions might impact a given community. Either it's not happened before or that information isn't available to turn the information into knowledge. An example of a leverage gap is simply communication cut off to remote areas. If the knowledge may be um, in hand in, a, in you know, a, um, a responsible agency for getting a flood warning out, but if there's no communication available or if the communication infrastructure has failed, um, then there's a leverage gap and the flood warning doesn't get to the people who need it. Uh, and then an execution gap, there's, there's a couple different ways to look at an execution gap. Um, it could be that the flood warning is issued, but it's issued in a way that people don't understand. It's not communicated effectively. Um, or it could also be that people receive the warning, but they're unwilling to evacuate. They're unwilling to take the action to protect their, themselves or their property due to lack of resources or fear of um, squatters or people taking their homes, things like that. So these are examples of how this framework could be applied for a specific example and help us identify what those gaps might be, what they are in your given example, and how to overcome those gaps and make some investments. So some on-the-ground examples from projects um, just to highlight some uh, specific cases of gaps that we, we've identified. Uh, Bangladesh is a country, as I'm sure everyone's well aware, that's very flood prone. It sits, do I have a pointer here? Oh, they wouldn't see it anyway. Um, it, <laughs> it would help for the people in the room, but it sits, uh, you can see on the map where it's labeled Bangladesh, it sits downstream of three major river systems. And what's important here is that the majority of the contributing area of those three major river systems, there we go, um, are in other countries. So Bangladesh is extremely dependent on other countries sharing their data with them for flood warning. There is an extensive and sophisticated flood warning center in Bangladesh, and because of the flood risk in that country, there's been extensive research and studies um, that have been ongoing in the country to, uh, so there, there, is, um, there is data, there are systems in place, but there's still design gaps meaning lack of data due to lack of sharing data across boundaries. One potential solution to this that has been explored is satellite-based data. RTI was involved in a study to investigate the value of satellite-based data to improve flood warnings in Bangladesh, as well as to in investigate the value of flood warnings overall. And this next example is one thing that came out of that study, and it's, it's an interesting example to me um, what I'm showing here in these two photos are a, um, a, stat, a colored um, staff gauge, a colored um, pole, essentially, that's in the ground next to a river. And that's a very simple indication for people living nearby of what water levels, um, what, what water levels, um, the, the risk of a particular water level. When the water reaches the red zone, that's dangerous. And people should, you know, pay attention. The left side, or the, sorry, the right side is a flag. It's a little bit hard to see, but there's a flag in the air on that side. And how that works is when there's um, a particular uh, risk level for impending flood, and that, that enables a forecast where the pole is current conditions. The, the flag enables indication of a forecast also with a colored flag. And what that does is translate information that might not be meaningful for people on the ground. So something like a you know, discharge amount, a flow level, a number that's not meaningful for people is translated into something that they can digest and has meaning for them, being the color of the pole or the color of the flag. Uh, so this overcame an execution gap of, of information not being communicated effectively on one hand. However, what RTI study found is that it needs to go a step further. That provides information right there on the stream bank but it is not, it's still not communicating effectively what does that mean for areas further inland? What, what kind of inundation might people expect if their homes are several miles inland? 
El Salvador is an example, also of a flood warning example. Um, we were involved, RPI has been involved in the development of the Hydrologic Forecast Center in El Salvador for nearly 20 years. Uh, and this is an example of overcoming, overcoming a fundamental execution gap being lack of resources. Um, there have been many, uh, we've overcome many um, gaps along the way in uh, implementing monitoring systems to actually have data. So in this case, um, what's really a success story about El Salvador is that after the international aid of develop, that, that was provided to develop that, for, that forecast center uh, ended, the country itself invested heavily in that forecast center, both in the people through, um, through um, sufficient salaries and also in the technology to develop what you see on the right, which is the risk, risk analysis center that still exists today. Um, so evidence of the success of that investment is that the people who we trained nearly 20 years ago are still there working in that risk, risk analysis center today and providing flood warnings to the people of El Salvador. Okay, so quickly, I'm going to go through the water security example relatively quickly. I want to give Barbara and Dennis time to, to cover their portion. Um, so essentially, it's a similar approach to break down a water security objective through this framework. There's differences in what is the data, what is the knowledge that we're, that we're um, striving to achieve, and what is the end result, the end result being sustainable water resources for a given region or community. And the examples in this case, it, this is also an example of the longer term, going back to George's breakdown of short, medium, and longer term decisions or objectives. This is an example of a longer term objective. Um, and uh, it could be either. It could be also warning people of imminent drought and water restrictions that are necessary. And in this case, many of the gaps involve lack of policy, um, lack of incentive to follow protocols, um, and you can break it down and, and really dig deep to figure out where um, what's causing these gaps. And one example of a water security related um, project is the work we've been doing in the Nile Basin. Uh, this is an example also of a data drought, uh, at least starting out. There's very little information in the Nile, um, hydrometeorological information available in the Nile Basin for effective water resources management. So a very first step is designing um, a monitoring network. And we're, we have been and are continuing to be involved with the Nile Basin Initiative to design a hydrometeorological network that will help and support the, uh, the 11 member countries of the Nile Basin Initiative in um, achieving more effective water resources management. So this is an example of the very initial stage of developing data from the ground from scratch where data previously was not available. Okay, so overall, um, from data, dr data droughts and data floods, when we're breaking it down and, and looking at it in this framework, uh, the data to value process and evaluating the data to value process and finding the gaps, um, it's really the same approach. Whether there's a data drought and we're looking for ways to make investments to create the data and overcome the initial design gap, or whether we have a lot of data and we're looking at where are there gaps in the process to go from data to value to the, the intended um, end result. And all in all, there's, um, in all cases, strengthening water governments to overcome those gaps is a key element. And with that, I will turn it over to Barbara to continue on that. Thank you very much, Katie and George. That was great. And this leads us now into looking at water governance more closely and why this data information transformation into evidence matters so much and can have the transformative effect that we all are looking for on critical wash needs around the world. And I was struck with uh, Katie and George's framework that I think we've probably all seen different manifestations of those gaps across the work, it, no matter the setting, truly no matter the, set, no matter the setting. And one of the things I was struck by um, that we didn't talk about before, but that the publicly available data is, is, a, is, a, is a new landscape, the growing amount of publicly available data that's almost creating a data flood in the lack, but, but in the framework of a lack of ability or kind of uh, institutional mechanisms to, to, to manage it. And it, it is changing the dynamic a little bit and something to think about as we go forward. All right, so why does it matter? 
We spoke during the opening about how governance is important in running anything well, from governments to business to vital resources. For me, the reason that this matters is anchored on the, the vital um, qualifier for the resources. Vital resources. Water doesn't get more vital <laughs> in terms of a resource for a country, for a family, for a community. Um, everyone, this means to me that everyone in the water sector has a responsibility to manage these resources in the most effective and sustainable way possible. Of course, the real question then is how do we do that? One of the most effective ways, effective ways to strengthen governance is to improve the basis on which governance decisions are made. So these decisions are based on good information that is put to use for not just informed policies, so those are very, very important, but institutional procedures, management decisions, all the way down to operating systems. As we've already heard, this information comes from a variety of sources, and to further complicate matters, it has to be adapted and tailored to a wide variety of people at all levels of the resources system. This slide shows just a broad overview of the many different people, institutions, organizations that play a key role across the water sector. And every single part of this picture needs different data, analyzed in different ways, packaged in different ways, and used and utilized for different kinds of decision making. For example, for our counterparts, our service providers, they need water quantity, water quality, and utility performance information. These are the building blocks of service delivery and of sustainable water resources management. You, you don't want to put a pump in the ground, you pump out a bunch of water from the ground if that aquifer is not sustainable, or if there's arsenic in the water, or if you know that there wasn't enough snow, snow melt, you can't plan on enough snow melt from the year before. The quality information is really important as well because you can always drill a borehole, but if the, the water is not of safe quality for drinking, you then have to treat it and so on. And what we see often, um, which we'll talk about more, is the utility performance information because these are high. You, Running a utility is literally built on the backs of understanding performance metrics. And yet too many utilities around the world are either not incentivized to collect that information or just don't have the resources because they're so busy simply keeping the pumps running and the pipes full. But there's other kinds of, inf of evidence that's really, really critically important to the water sector. The communities and customers need information as well. Communities need to understand what water resources are appropriate and viable for their use. Customers need to understand and be, and be confident that the water that they're, they're receiving is safe for whatever purpose that that is, be it a business, be it a, be it a household. <coughs> and there's ways in which you can actually generate evidence. Town hall meeting. These can be incredibly powerful. Simply having the head of a water utility stand in front of a community is its own kind of evidence. Then there's more formal kinds of evidence, regulatory reports. Media coverage. If there's a big, splashy media story about how there's problems with the water quality, it doesn't matter what, sometimes it won't matter what tests are actually saying if the people will believe the evidence has been in the paper. So it's incredibly important to have ways to ensure that the right information is getting to the right people. And I think what often gets overlooked in thinking through the kinds of evidence we need and who needs it is the, very, is the vast amount of evidence and information that we need on the donor and the implementing partner side. And that the nature of this information is changing. We're finding incredible value uh, in political economy analysis, and we're going to talk a bit more about that. And there's research reports, and there's monitoring and evaluation, and you, these this kind of information is has, it has to be fed back into a constant adaptation as we design new programs, as we adapt implementation in progress. 
So I want to take a little bit of a step back. We're using, we're throwing these terms around data, information, evidence, and talk a little bit about how we're defining evidence as opposed to information. The Oxford Dictionary tells us that the available body of facts or information indicating whether a belief or a proposition is true or valid is evidence. And I think that the, to me, the, the, the key defining factor here is that when information becomes used for an actionable uh, purpose, it becomes evidence. Because data in isolation without analysis is information, and frankly can sometimes be more harmful than helpful. When it's used for action and corroboration, it becomes evidence. And to us, this is the goal of strengthening governance. This is where you actually have the positive benefits that we're, that we're striving for in evidence-based decision-making, is to improve water sector governance. To demonstrate why this is important in practice and not just in principle, we're going to look at a few cases where the impact <coughs> of applying even the rudimentary evidence-based decision-making has had a profound effect on sector goals. So first I want to talk a little bit about um, an experience we had in Jordan on the USAID Institutional Support and Strengthening Program. This is a five-year program working on comprehensive water sector reform. Towards the end of the program, we were drilling down into more of the operational uh, impact to improve service delivery at the, at the small scale utility level. So we organized a pilot project working specifically on operational performance improvement. As you can see here, the objective was to support operational and management changes that would have a tangible effect on service delivery. So we started, this was a, this was a very small six-month pilot project, $250,000. So low cost, low barrier to entry, but I think you'll see it, it, had, a, it had a significant impact. So first we had, we had to generate evidence. So the opening activity was, a, was, was an assessment, looking at the critical operational needs. That generated the evidence we needed to determine where to target our support. And that evidence was presented to the general manager of the utility and to you know, our client, USAID, so that they could collectively agree on what activities had to be carried out. Evidence-based decision-making, step one. Then we actually turned to our, the activities. So we executed a series of operational activities around data collection, regular so operational performance data collection, production rates, um, electricity use, customer billing, some, some of the fairly basic metrics for our water utility. We instituted a systemic change in the operations to do regular monitoring and reporting on these fundamental key performance indicators. So we were creating evidence for utility, the utility operators. The end result that they had production wells that went from only half being metered to all of them being metered, and we established the routine monitoring visits and the, and the data collection for that. Then the fun began because we then started analyzing the information that was collected. They realized that they were significantly overestimating their production. And so they had been coming up short habitually and thought it was from other things. They thought there was leakage. They thought there was, other, there was some theft going on. When in fact, their overall production at this one well field was, as you can see, significantly lower once they actually started measuring it. So they were able to build, drill some new production wells make up for the, the shortfall, and stop having to have emergency supplies delivered at significantly extra cost to households. Then the new monitoring system, because people were actually finally going out to these wells to collect the data, found out that a number of pumps were working in terms of, in fact, by, in meaning that they were actually on and churning it out, but not actually producing any water. So when we presented the information and reviewed the information with them on how much electricity those faulty pumps were using, the difference when those pumps were replaced 
as you can see, was a savings of 6,800 JD a month, Jordanian dinar a month. The dinar at the time was valued at roughly the same as the euro. Um, so you can see that this is a big, big difference from some very, very simple information. One month savings paid to replace the pump. Um, in Nigeria, this, base, this lack of basic operational information is what the USAID WASH program is currently grappling with. And for that, we're very fortunate to have Dennis Wanza, our chief of party here. And I'm going to turn it over to him to discuss this more fully. Well, thank you so much, uh, Barbara. And um, I think we've heard uh, quite a lot about um, um, lack of evidence as well as uh, uh, you know having evidence there. We have a situation in Nigeria where uh, the state water boards, these are basically water companies, but uh, owned by government and actually operating as a civil servant. What I can say is actually publicly to state that uh, uh, they're very inefficient, and I'll say this even in the country itself, because that is the reality. And even the, uh, the, the people in terms, of, uh, in terms of consumers know the situation and so on. But those are, the facts are not publicly available, if I can put it that way. Uh, it's only uh, evidence through uh, the performance in terms of uh, lack of uh, water and so on. But the reality is that there's no uh, availability of customer data. Or if it is there, it's uh, very scanty. And then uh, um, in this day and age, uh, it's manual billing and collection. Well, of course, collection would do, uh, kind of the manual, but uh, the actual billing, so people actually sit down to write, uh, to physically write the, uh, the bills. Um, for those who are engineers, or at least uh, know about the technical issues, you know, uh, the pumps do have some, you know, some kind of calibration, and that's what they depend on, but still more, there's no production data. Um, even just simple things like keeping a record of how much, how many hours you have been pumping, you to, to help you determine, uh, you know, how much water you have actually pumped in a day, uh, you know, through the, uh, the calibration of the pump, um, you know, it's not there. And then uh, no operational and maintenance uh, plans, um, and then, uh, of course, data collection itself is defunct and, um, uh, and there is no key performance indicators used. Now, this is what I think we've already talked about in terms of uh, drought, data drought. but uh, which, uh, through the program that we are running, has been realized, and that is the first thing that we have to do, to uh, mobilize this very information to, uh, to be used uh, in terms of deciding what next, how do we, uh, you, know, how to, uh, you know, how do we pro uh, you know, continue in terms of the performance improvement. So changing the institutional arrangements in terms of policies, but also changing the way that the uh, the utilities themselves uh, perform. Uh, the second example which I wanted to give is uh, in Mozambique. This was uh, through another USAID funded uh, program. Uh, another USAID funded uh, uh, program um, uh, in Mozambique and uh, from Maputo. It's a very interesting, unique situation where uh, Maputo had a, a company which was owned by, it was a privately managed company known as Agua, uh, you know, ARDM, uh, basically from, uh, from Portugal. The efficiency was quite low. So as a result, there was a lot of self-service, uh, self, uh, you know, uh, solutions uh, in terms of boreholes coming up. But what happened is that because of the cost of coming up, uh, you know, drilling boreholes, um, individuals started selling water to their neighbors, and that resulted into mini water companies. Uh, so, but there was a, so there was a slight uh, denial from the uh, the government. So yes, that was the, the company, the public water utility. Uh, the government knew that uh, there was a lot of um, self service and the uh, through these individual, you know, companies connecting people, uh, people in, the, in the neighborhood, but they did not know the scale of the problem. So, um, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sure. Yeah, so they did not know the scale of the problem. Uh, these small-scale water providers, as they were called, though later on they were really big, 
uh, is that they were unlicensed, uh, their tar tariffs were high, but because but efficient in terms of provision, flexible in terms of payment, because they were in the communities themselves. And some of them in high cost residential areas, some of them in uh, low cost residential areas. Uh, <clears throat> so, while well, of course the public utility provided uh, a low tariff in terms of uh, the water itself, but inefficient. Uh, so, people have had the uh, choice between low tariff, but uh, very inefficient service provision, or a higher tariff from somebody who is uh, your neighbor, uh, who is flexible and services uh, is more. So, we did a survey, uh, what we called an inventory, and that inventory revealed something which even the government themselves could not believe, that there were 816 small private water providers within uh, this city, and that uh, actually, uh, so they will provide piped water supply and that more connection in total than the public utility itself. Total investments, uh, the total investments about uh, five million. Anyway, as a result of this um, uh, information, uh, three things happened. One was uh, um, introduction of uh, policy and the legislation. Uh, so basically to formalize uh, the, the, the private water providers and licensing framework, and then, of course, uh, the regulatory framework. Being formalized meant that now things were, uh, you know, quality of service was improved, and as I say, the tariff was now kind of controlled. Uh, thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much, Dennis. That was great. And just going to quickly wrap up with a couple other um, closing slides. I mean, I think that I do want to highlight how there is new kinds of evidence now that's being used in different ways as well, um, because we have to recognize what a key role the donors are making in ensuring that the programs are designed to meet these critical needs effectively and are targeting the right issues. We have seen an incredible growth in the use of political economy analysis, and with it having very, very positive and, and a powerful impact. Um, a PEA has, has it enables us to really pull the curtain back on issues that have nothing to do with the technical challenges of the sector. Um, and, and, and then you have you, it allows you then to work creatively to work around some of these backdoor um, challenges, <laughs> at least. And, 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 and they've been fundamental in enabling us to really reprogram or at least rethink how we're programming our assistance. And I, I think it, you can't talk about evidence without talking about monitoring, evaluation, and learning, the metal side of things as well. Um, this is a, has to be a constant feedback loop, as I know we, you know, all of us as practitioners in the field are aware of the value of this, but it can't be overstated because often we talk about the sector evidence and we talk a lot about the, the technical data around water resources management, but these two new, these, this type of data is just as important in making sure, um, and more importantly, that we're actually building MEL capacity into our into the, our counterpart institutional capacity. And just a few final thoughts, because going back to the, the fact of, as Dennis was saying, the, the studies told the government things that they had, couldn't have imagined. But it's, it, it, you've got to keep that information accessible. You don't want to hand a minister a 50-page report. Keep it simple. Turn the data into evidence, and but calibrate the analysis and the delivery and the report to what your user, your end user, and your decision maker actually needs. Your operator needs a different level of information on monitoring data than your minister does or even your general manager. So my final, our final point, it's what you do with it that counts. And we would now like to open it up for questions, and we thank you very much for all your time during the presentation. So we've collected some questions online. <coughs> so the first question is for Katie and George. How do you harmonize the risk of unknown thresholds of, say, a flood and the unwillingness to evacuate, especially if we take the example of remote areas where the insecurity over their assets is, a huge, is huge due to the lack of trust of government institutions? We saw one example in March during the cyclone Idai in sub-Saharan Africa, Mozambique, and Malawi. Did you experience that? Um, not firsthand, but that's, yeah. um, that's certainly a huge challenge to, 
I think communication is key. Communication of the, the level of risk. And, um, you know, on the science side, we still have you know, advances that can happen in terms of better forecasts. But on the communication side, it's um, improving the message and improving the kind of, you know, how we convey the level of risk um, that is impending and making sure that that gets to the right people with enough time that they have the ability to you know, make the decision. Any other thoughts? Yeah, and I, I, yeah. I guess it's really more of a challenge than the, the solution, but just communicating uncertainty in forecasts is going to be a challenge at all levels. I mean, it's tempting to sort of look at a, a, a median forecast or, or sort of a mid-level, but a lot of times people need to look at sort of, they want to be risk averse and they want to look at sort of the full range of possibilities and make decisions, but that's a lot of information to, for a lot of people to incorporate. So finding that balance between you know, giving them the information they need um, it is, you know, it's, it is a challenge. Great. Another question here was that good water resources management decisions can either be expensive or not as politically maybe as expedient as other government spending priorities. How do you get the support you need to implement stronger water governance? Dennis, you want to take that one? <laughs> well, I think the, the, the issue of evidence is, uh, is certainly what would help because the uh, why do governments prioritize certain, uh, you know, certain uh, interventions against, say, like water resources and so on, which whose actual impact may come a little later? So, giving them the evidence or the data that if we don't do this now, this will be the impact, you know, coming up and then uh, help them prioritize. Yeah, I, I found that as well, and I have to say that. Um, it's also partly about changing the incentive, yeah. right? Because, yes, a road is more politically, immediately politically expedient. But if you start building in social accountability into the process and generate the demand within the communities for safe, effective water and create the expectation, for example, that those investments make sense, <coughs> it can have a profound impact and it can change the dynamic. Another question here was, please explain more on setting thresholds for inundation. Please help us know the best approaches of forecasting flash floods and give some examples. So threshold for inundation would be, would require understanding of the characteristics of the environment um, around a, a river or stream reach that's expected to flood. And therefore, inundation being water leaves the stream bank and, you know, and um, inundates a local community. So it's a, it, it requires knowing where communities are located, knowing information like elevation of the surrounding community, and having the science. Um, it, it requires some analysis to um, understand where the water is going to go. Um, in certain cases, and there's there's very rigorous ways to do that, but there's also approximate ways to do that. Uh, so more and more, that's you know, as we as we talk about impact-based forecasting, is um, kind of the direction that we're going in the forecasting community, and that is um, not just giving um, kind of that point-based information, but or just giving sort of um, vague information. It's it's translating into what are the actual impacts, and inundation is a perfect example of that. Not just it's going to flood, but this building in this location is going to have one or two feet of water. And then people can better understand what to do about that. But the, the science behind getting from stream flow to, to inundation requires some hydrologic analysis. Great. Another question here is, you talked about the importance of the PEAs and understanding some of the non-traditional and unexpected issues. Um, you face in driving reform, but these are also highly sensitive and often confidential. So how can this evidence be used by decision makers? You want to take that one, Dennis? You want me to? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, a, it's an actually it's a great question because the PEAs are are specifically for the client, right? These are these are actually internal documents, and and in order to get the information that 
of the most use and the most relevance, you actually have to ensure the confidentiality of the, of the people that you interview. So the political economy analysis goes in and talks to a huge range of stakeholders that, that frankly often don't get asked these questions, but you can understand some of the mechanics behind the decisions that they're making. And for right now, that information get, gets used in a couple of different ways. Part of it is that you understand the incentives for the policymakers, so you can work to start changing those incentives. Part of so, so you're not you're never going to hand, say, you know, your permanent secretary or your minister the PEA report, but you're going to use the information you learned from that to generate the support around that key decision maker um, because you actually have a much better understanding of what is influencing the decision makers of that official. And it's not going to be, for the most part, the things you thought or just the things that you thought. And that's certainly what we found in, in Nigeria. And I'll, I'll give one example of one of our states, no, I won't tell you, where there's, there's a huge resistance to going to water services from the utility because there's a whole side racket, really, private bill collectors that the, that the jerry can providers are, are using. So there's a huge black market income providing water in this city, and it's a lot easier for them to basically undermine the utility and keep their own income and income and mini economy going than to actually provide incentives to and there's corruption issues and everything else. So it's to actually go in and reform the utility to provide the water services that people need. I just want to add that actually there's a lot of value in uh, undertaking PEA because as Barbara had rightly mentioned, it helps us understand uh, what are the incentives or why are people doing uh, you know certain things. Uh, of course, uh, we, we don't have, have to make them public because as we have already said, these are confidential documents. But as designers and implementers of uh, reforms, you actually know why certain decisions or certain uh, things are happening in that way. And you can, with that information, you can actually, uh, you know, change course or, uh, you know, adapt. So we only have two minutes left. Um, so it's a question for um, George and Katie. What range of flood warnings should be communicated to the community to avoid panic? <laughs> <laughs> what range of flood warnings? That that's going to be a community specific answer, um, and there's no easy answer to that. I think that that requires knowing the community and knowing the context and. You know, so the question is, as I understand it, you know, when do you give a warning, um, at what level of uncertainty or what level of, um, I guess, severity? At what level do you give a warning with the risk of, of creating panic versus holding back and, and waiting to see what happens? Um, so that's, that's somewhat of a social science question of um, human reaction to information. And, and then it really boils down also to, um, how do you communicate the uncertainty again, right? right? And that, that's a challenge everywhere, and we're seeing that here in the U.S., we're seeing that everywhere, that forecasts are inherently very uncertain. So how do you, how do you capture that and, and make use of that information and convey something that's meaningful to people? There's no easy answer to that, but it is something that I think uh, within the forecasting community are very aware of and, and working towards better communication of, of forecasts and warnings yeah. under uncertainty. Yeah, because I suppose the temptation is to think that's the case where information actually has negative value, right? That you're actually going to, mm -hmm. but and in, and in some sense it does. And so the challenge then is to is to improve that communication and and translate it into something that you know leads to better outcomes uh, for the people affected. It's getting people used to un uncertain uncertain information mm -hmm. and being able to kind of make a judgment um, under those circumstances. Well, and I can actually, just to kind of wrap things, I can see there being a governance lens as well because it's a public trust issue. If you trigger warning too often without floods actually happening, you erode public trust yeah. in the system and in the, the warning system. Um, but you also need to, you need to believe that the government that has issued the warning 
or the organization that has issued the warning, typically the local government, right, is actually going to be able to do something about it and has a place for people to go or resources in place to support the affected communities. Mm -hmm. So, and that's where engagement and calibration, again, of the information as well as then the decisions that are yeah. made around that become so important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody. We very much appreciate your time. We are at 10.01, so I don't want to keep anybody any longer. We will um, make the presentations available um, to those that have registered. We'll be sending those out. So uh, again, if you have any other questions as we go along, we'll um, provide an email address as well where you can continue the dialogue. Thank you again for joining us, and I hope you have a great day.